Sam Shankland, welcome to Nervous Habits. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. For those who don't know, uh, Sam is a grandmaster, which is sort of like being a Hall of Fame baseball player. There are about 800 million chess players in the world, and only roughly 1,700 of them are grandmasters. So that's, what, a 0.0002% uh, chance. You basically have a better chance of getting struck by lightning while winning an Olympic gold medal than you do ever coming close to being a grandmaster. Um, and anyway, Sam, have you found that during the pandemic, uh, over the last six months, more and more people have you know shown an interest in chess? Yeah, so part of that is basically people in general, like there's a lot of people who just love sports. I'm one of them. Uh, people love sports, it's what they do. And chess, uh, Really, it should be played face-to-face. -face. Uh, I think classical chess face-to-face -face encounters is what really chess should be. But basically, it's harder to play chess online and have it be serious, but it is impossible to play basketball online. Like, just flat-out impossible. You cannot have yeah. you know, the... You can't have the Knicks versus the Warriors. Oh, we're going to just play online now. So uh, basically, because chess, I think, took a bit of a hit and having to move most of its events or just about all of its serious events to online, it didn't take nearly as big a hit as, like, literally any other sport you can imagine. So mm -hmm. as a result, people I think have become much more interested. They can follow their favorite players. They learn about the game. Uh, there've been, we've done a good job of stepping up our commentary and I don't want to say dumbing it down, but making it more accessible to, uh, to let's say beginner level players or people who are more recreational. Most top events have really, really good commentators who are very good players themselves and are going deep into all the intricate details of all the things people do. That's generally not that interesting to people who are just sort of looking for a sporting spectacle and have don't really know much about chess. And right. uh, we're definitely, so nowadays most top events will have two commentary streams, one for like serious players who are trying to follow the game seriously and others for just sort of sports fans. And that additional commentary has helped a lot. The fact that, you know, we have less competition in terms of real sports, I guess you could say is helping a lot as well. I guess that's mm -hmm. somewhat changing now, but um, but there was a time where there was just no sports and chess was all we had. And so I think that definitely helped facilitated the growth in chess. Plus, it's just something you can do at home, you know, in a way other things you just can't. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and sort of to your point, everyone for a while last year in 2020 was stuck at home for months in lockdown. There wasn't a lot on TV. And so chess.com reported, you know, a sharp increase in people registering. Um, Amazon and eBay reported that, you know, chess boards were widely sold out. Uh, some of that also has to do with pop culture. Uh, you know, the, the Netflix show, The Queen's Gambit. How, how many times did you see that, Sam? Uh, believe it or not, I still have to see the last episode. I've seen the first six and I still have to see the last one. I know what happens because I was supposed to talk about it at some point. But um, yeah, I think The Queen's Gambit, chess has been portrayed in a lot of different ways in movies over the years. It's been tried a bunch of times. For example, the most recent one, I can remember prior to this was Pawn Sacrifice, which was sort of a biography of Bobby Fischer, where Tobey Maguire played Bobby Fischer. Uh, oh, I got to watch that one. Tobey to 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 Maguire is one, one, one of my favorites. Yeah, it was good. But the thing that The Queen's Gambit did was it made it more realistic. I think that The Queen's Gambit, certainly it took its creative liberties. It is fiction. There were things about it that weren't the way they really work. Uh, but it did a much better job of portraying the way the chess world actually looks than just about anything I've seen. And it was much more honest about it in a way that people are, I think, more likely to identify with. So for example, uh, when people, a lot of the times if you're in your own little niche world, like chess, for example, you sort of want to portray your world as best as you possibly can to the outside world whenever you see it, uh, which makes a lot of sense. You want to look your best. You want to... Um, you want to make it look like it's a serious world. But a lot of the times people can just realize, wait, that's that's fake. That's phony. These are like not real people. Like what what is this? And with the Queen's Gambit, when you saw the actual struggles people went through, substance abuse, the, the substance abuse, the promiscuity, the crazy travel, like, you know, the, <laughs> yeah. the kind of things that you would almost more associate with like, I guess, rock bands or something like that. Uh, it really, I think, struck a chord with a lot of people and they, they understood a lot more about the personal struggles that chess players would go through because ultimately I think almost every other uh almost every other chess rendition in media has been basically chess portrayed but this one wasn't really about chess it was about the play. exactly it was about the people it was a story of people 
And look, I'm not a, a, set, a chess savant by any means. So when I heard it was a, ch- a show about chess, you know, I was wondering how exciting could it could it be? But then when you have this series that was number one on Netflix in the world for something like, you know, several weeks in a row, as you said, yeah. it took its creative liberties, the cinematography, the soundtrack, the performances were so beautifully done. But there were other things, you know, that, that were attractive, like the addiction, like the substance abuse. Um, I'm curious. So the lead character, Beth, you know, something of a chess prodigy, um, if you didn't see the show, she would actually stare up at the ceiling and imagine, you know, the the different moves and all the potential, uh, you know, combinations. Is that something you see at a match? People staring up at the ceiling or uh, yeah, it's, it's, it depends things? because basically, if you're trying to you're trying to see a position deep in the future and figure out what's going to happen many moves from now. At some point, when you start calculating lines and you're looking at something that could easily be like six, seven, ten, however many moves ahead. It's really going to look almost nothing like the position you have on the board. And so uh, the position on the board in front of you might just distract you. It's like it's you, you see something that's a chess position that looks nothing like what we're trying to think about. So, for example, if you have a position here and you have, let's say, two options to consider. And in one of those options, the next four moves for both sides are completely forced and there's nothing to even bother thinking about, you're gonna reach that position. And you have to evaluate, is that position something I want to go for? And you start calculating from there. The best thing you can do is probably just stop looking at the position you have in front of you and consider that one in your head. And if you're basically like, if I'm telling, I guess a good analogy would be like, if I'm telling you to do some math in your head, and let's say uh, the first, you, you start with the number one, and then you do like four things to it immediately, and that gets you to the number 12. And then I say, do these next few things to the number 12 to try to calculate what's going on. Would you want like a big number one staring you in the face what, that you have to look at the number one the whole time you're trying to do something with the number 12? It just doesn't mm-hmm. make sense. And so that's something like in general, it depends what you're trying to do. But if you're trying to calculate variations, like specifically, I do this, he does that, I do this, he does that, some very concrete set of moves, one right after the other and figure out what's going on. It's not uncommon for people to just stare into the ceiling because it's easier. When you would not stare into the ceiling is when you're thinking thematically, like, oh, this position, well, which one of my pieces is not on its best square? How can I improve that piece? And you sort of like think about very strategic thinking as opposed to move for move thinking. When you'd be gotcha. doing that, you definitely wouldn't be staring into the ceiling. So Sam, let's take a step back. Um, for folks that aren't as familiar with your career, if you had to estimate as a grandmaster, how many games of chess have you played in your life? Are we talking tens it of depends, thousands, hundreds of thousands? It depends what we call games. If we call nonsense on the internet or silly games with my friends when at, like when they come over or something. Yeah, I mean, I've probably played something like 10,000 games online, which are maybe even more, all of which are not wildly serious. But in terms of like serious classical tournament games where I show up, and they're officially rated and everything. Uh, I think I've played probably something like 1,200. Got you, got you. Just just sort of providing um, some context. Something else I wanted to ask you from, from the Queen's Gambit is a lot of the competitors in that series would study the game boards after the matches were over. Um, that's something that you saw Beth do and, and Harry do and Benny. In your experience, is, you know, when you compete in a tournament, do you go over all of your moves? Do you review the board like that? Is that realistic? Uh, so I don't during the tournament because, for example, imagine you lose a game and you have to come back the next day and fight and keep fighting and you don't want to be you want to be in the best possible frame of mind. The absolute worst thing you can do is go over, look at this game like, oh, I just missed this winning continuation. What an idiot I am. Like, how did I how did I screw this up? The best thing you can do is just put it behind you. So what I always do is I I don't check the games uh, during the tournament. I just try to make sure a it takes energy as well. So you want to make sure that you're well rested and ready to fight for the next one. You also want to make sure you're emotionally in the right place. And if you find out that you've missed the chance, this can mess with your attitude. It can mess with your confidence uh, in ways that I don't like. Uh, but of course, when the tournament is over and I'm back at home, then I will look at all of the games and try to make an assessment of what I did wrong in this event uh, to try to improve for the next one. I just think it, it makes more sense to when you're at a tournament, your only focus should be what can I do to be in my best form for the next game? Well, when you're at home after the tournament's over, your focus is, okay, what did I do well this tournament? What did I do badly? What can I improve for next time? Absolutely. It's almost like, uh, you know, you mentioned sports earlier. If you're, I'm I'm a baseball fan. If you're in the batter's box and you have a one, two count, you can't be thinking, oh man, like I I totally missed that last curveball. I missed you. You got to sort of put that behind you and be thinking to prepare yourself for, for what comes next. 
Right, and you have more tools. Like you will have instant replays. You will see if you swung over it or under it, which you probably won't even know until you've gone back to the dugout and, exactly. and seen the replay. You know, there's you don't want to be making improvements in the middle of your at bat. You just want to do the best that you can, and then once your at bat is over, you go back and then you you take batting practice and you work on that. So it's just chess is the same way. During a tournament, I don't worry about becoming a better player. I just try to be the best that I can be at that given moment. Uh, and then once the tournament's over, that's when training begins. I love that. I love that analogy. And I think that's, that's a great philosophy. So last thing that, that you mentioned with regards to the series I wanted to touch on is with substance abuse. I would think that in a competitive high pressure environment, like these chess tournaments, there's pressure to, you know, get an advantage. I, I, I don't know if, if you've seen in your experience, competitors take um, performance enhancing drugs like uh, Adderall or, or amphetamines. Is that something common or, or, you know, do people drink a lot uh, or was that just sort of sensationalized? Well, people definitely sort of... drink a lot. Um, yeah. But uh, I don't know much about performance enhancing drugs. I've never used any. I, I think chess has changed a lot in that in the era where the Queen's Gambit was portrayed, most of the best chess players in the world, I guess, with, I mean, I'm not sure if this was portrayed this way, but until Bobby Fischer came around, and I believe Beth Harmon is loosely based on him, the one American yeah. who took on the world. Until he came around, chess, basically like the best chess players in the world were like, you know, professional musicians or like doctors or lawyers who had other professions and made, and did chess as their thing on the side as an amazing hobby they were good at. Sort of like how, I guess in theory, when the Olympics started, they were supposed to be quote unquote amateur athletes. Well, that's obviously completely different now. And now that chess is, you're good. Welcome to California. That was an earthquake. <laughs> oh, oh, seriously? I'm dead. Yeah, I'm dead serious. That was just an earthquake. Welcome to California. Uh, that was wow. probably like a 4.5 would be my guess. But um, yeah, it was pretty strong. Uh, yeah. So, um, but uh, yeah, uh, man, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, but so basically, yeah, I got it. So chess, now that chess is a more professional thing, you see like everything people do in, over the course of their day-to-day -day life is to become a better chess player. And a big part of that is staying in good physical condition. And for people who have abused their bodies and put substances into them that really don't help them perform well or help them stay in good health, that can be very harmful. And uh, basically, if you look at the best chess players in the world from that era, they were sort of portrayed as often middle-aged to somewhat older they were often, you didn't look at them and think this is an athlete. They were off, they might be heavy or skinny or whatever. If you look at the best players in the world today, it's almost without exception, very athletic young men. And that's mm. really a sign that the sporting element is really important. Now, it doesn't really matter how fit you are when you play your first game of the tournament. But if you want to play the seventh hour of your ninth game, as well as the first hour of your first game, you really need to be fit, strong, and healthy. And a lot of guys who had substance abuse issues just didn't get to be that good and uh they could be brilliant as you all want no matter how talented you are if you mess up your brain you're not going to succeed there's a lot of guys out there who had substance abuse issues didn't reach their potential and then once they got clean next thing you know they're just you know absolute top elite players and so that was definitely something that's part of the chess world i think substance abuse is pretty common among anybody who lives in a very high stress world where high performance is like absolutely essential and uh it's definitely something that is not, you know, sort of been glossed over as chess players. If we were trying to portray the to portray chess to the outside world, you know, we don't want to say, oh, guess what? Chess players are a bunch of drug addicts. That's not really going to make the game popular. But it's it's good to be honest about the struggles people face. And you know, so it's some, like the Queen's Gambit saw, some people face these problems more than others. Some people did, and some people didn't. And that's just like the way humanity works in general. Definitely. And it's also good to show all of the different dimensions. I think sort of, as you alluded to earlier, when people thought of chess a couple of years ago and the way it was portrayed, it was very singular, you know, one dimensional, you know, people are, are studying all the time and, and trying to perfect their craft. But now you realize chess players are human beings, just like anyone else. Chess players are, are athletes who struggle with, with these addictive tendencies. Um, I just want to clarify, you mentioned a moment ago, the seventh hour of your ninth game. So for people who aren't super familiar with chess, on average, how long do these games last? Is that is seven, seven hours? Uh, seven hours is a very long game. But yeah. basically the way it works is nowadays the most common time control you will face is uh, you will be given an hour and a half for all of your moves and you can allocate that time however you wish. Mm -hmm. After your 40th move, you will get an additional uh, 30 minutes. So that will be up to two hours. 
total for games that last longer than 40 moves for each side, but also after every single move, you will get an additional 30 seconds. So in theory, a game could last approximately forever and in practice, it never does. Seven hours was the longest I've ever played a game. That was, it's not typical for it to last that long. And a stand, an average game I would say is somewhere between three and a half and the high end would be five. Got you. Got wow. So it's I mean, how do you? Th- th- there, are, there are so many uh, questions with with stamina there. But you know, sort of taking a step back, I I, I want listeners to get a sense of, of how you became you know the 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 grandmaster you are. Obviously, you you competed on the U.S. Olympic team. Um, you know, you you have what a twenty seven hundred rating in in chess yeah, I, right now. I I dropped a little bit below, but at my peak, I was twenty seven thirty one and number twenty two in the world. So. I mean, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it really doesn't get any better than that. I mean, you're, you're one of the best living chess players in the country, if not the world. Um, Sam, how old were you when you played your first ga- game of chess? Can, can you, can, can you so remember? My dad taught me how to play when I was six, but I never really got into it. I didn't, it didn't like, I didn't enjoy it or whatever. I never really started. Uh, it was only when I took my first after school chess class with the Berkeley chess school in fourth grade, when I was, I guess, nine that I started to uh, take the game a little more seriously. And that's actually an incredibly late start. I ended up playing my first tournament right around the time I turned 11. Most guys are playing their first tournament, like at least guys who made it to the absolute top in the world are playing their first tournament when they're like five. You know, we've had <laughs> wow. like the world's, the world's youngest grandmaster ever was 12 years old, just under 13. I mean, you think about like, if you're competing with someone who became a grandmaster at 12 and you start at 11, that's tough. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so I, I started a bit late, uh, but I quickly got into it. Like there was one kid who was just the best kid in the school. Everybody just knew it. And uh, I had never been to chess club class before. So I went to the after school chess class and just completely crushed him. And then uh, I just sort of, I was always a good athlete, but never a great one. Like, you know, if there was whatever, 80 boys in my grade, I might be number five, which was good, but you're not making any NBA drafts. We all know that. We, let's get real. And so as I got yeah. older and I started, as you know, I got one to bigger school districts and then it became harder and harder to remain competitive in physical sports to the level that I would have liked. And I just found that chess, I was just winning and winning and winning. It really fueled my competitive need in a way where, I mean, I, st- I still love sports to this day. I'm just not as good as obviously in chess. And uh, it just fueled my competitive need. In general, I think people are predisposed to like things they're good at. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just very good at it. I got a lot better really fast and never really stopped playing. So you made you made a lot of of 20 and 30 something year old listeners feel feel pretty shitty when you said that there was a someone who became a grandmaster at 12 and most people learned to play chess at 5. I have friends, I mean I'm I'm 28 and I you know I've gotten into chess in the last year. I have friends who are older than me who've gotten into chess in the last year. So um to think that there are are children out there 5 years yeah. old who could beat you know, who could beat us in a game of chess is, yeah. is pretty disappointing. But you have to keep in mind, you know, you guys are playing for the love of the game. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't recommend any 35 year old say, oh, I'm going to give up everything, learn how to play chess and become a professional player. I think that's a bad idea. I would absolutely say that if you want to learn to play chess, by all means, go for it. It'll be a lot of fun. Go play tournaments. You'll have a great time. You'll make new friends. You'll enjoy yourself in a competitive mental game. But like, uh, if you want to compare yourself to like the absolute best players in the world, when you start that late, it's just impossible. But um, Got you. keep in mind, most people don't make grandmaster at 12. <laughs> that was yeah. just my day. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious, Sam, when you were beginning, um, you know, take us back a little bit. Was, was chess hard when you were in fourth grade and playing for the first time, or did it just no. sort of come naturally to you? It, it came naturally to me. I, you know, I started playing tournaments like, so I played my first tournament like sometime towards the end of fifth grade, I think. Uh, and then sixth grade next year, like I was playing on board one for the state championship for K6, like just like a year after starting playing. I was about to be state champion. I lost the last round, but like <laughs> I was, I started with five wins out of six and then lost a lot of this game. And did you, you know, did you take lessons? Um, this was before, I mean, if you were in sixth grade, this was probably before the internet. So you didn't have chess.com yeah, I or mean, anything like that. It was sort of coming around, but like, I didn't have the sort of, nobody was there to tell me what programs to use or something. For example, almost every really good chess player of my generation, let's say born between something like 1985 to 95, uh, almost every good player, like world elite level player from there, had a family member who played chess and was teaching them pretty early on. And I did it. My parents did a fantastic job supporting me. 
Uh, but they also, I mean, if you told them, oh, there's, you, you need to help Sam with the resources on the internet, there weren't, they wouldn't know where to look. I mean, I played on the internet chess club, ICC, which is now I think almost completely gone. As far as I know, it's just been completely overtaken by chess.com and chess 24. But I was mm -hmm. playing on that site and just getting games in, which was helpful, but mainly I would just go and play in tournaments. There was the Berkeley chess school, the Berkeley chess club would run their adult tournaments every Friday night where I get to play one game on Friday nights. And then uh, the mechanics Institute chess club in San Francisco was, uh, would run tournaments, you know, once or twice a month. And I would just play these events. Uh, I would, whenever I would lose, I would get free lessons because no matter how much it hurt, no matter how much I wanted to cry, because uh, it's really tough to lose. I mean, I, I hate losing even to this day. I don't think you ever get good if you don't mind it. But no matter how much I wanted to cry, if I lost to somebody, especially if they were a better player than me, I would always ask them, where do you think I made my mistake? Where do you think I could have played better? And I would listen to them. And that's basically wow. the best form of a free lesson. Uh, and then eventually I got some training, but it wasn't, uh, I didn't get a, a grandmaster coach, for example, until I was like in jun a junior in high school. That's so impressive because it seems like, and, and we'll talk later about the, the cultural differences, but in, in lots of these countries, you think of, of Russia, you know, th these, these families are, are um, you know, are sort of grooming the, the chess prodigies or um, you have grandmasters training other people to be grandmasters. So to know that you're self-made, that you've, you became a grandmaster, an Olympic level competitor on your own is, is really impressive. Yeah. Well, they're self-made and they're self-made. I mean, it's not like I grew up in Eskimo and like, you know, had to, you know, and just literally lived in an igloo and there was no tournaments, no boards, no nothing. And I just, you know, bought a board and taught myself to play. I definitely had like really great opportunities in my opinion, like growing up in California where there was, you know, the, both the Mechanics Institute Chess Club and the Berkeley Chess Club uh, where, you know, I could get, free lectures from, you know, reasonably good players, certainly not world elite ones, but ones you knew enough to like, that you could actually definitely learn something from as an aspiring youngster. I definitely grew up in an area where, you know, compared to the rest of the world, I think I was very lucky, but compared to the specific subsections of the rest of the world, like the places you're describing, I would have, they would have had much more opportunities there. Got you. Got you. So, um, you know, sort of to, to set the scene a little bit, um, you, you know, went through grade school, you ended up finishing high school, went to, went to college. We went to Brandeis together, obviously. So yeah. it seems like you didn't really envision chess being a career in your, you know, in your formative years. When, when did that change? Well, so it was sort of a weird transformation. So basically like when I was, a, I was not a great student in high school. I was not a great student in college either. I've never been particularly good at giving people what they want. Um, but, uh, I mean, I would learn stuff. I felt like I learned the material. Like I speak next to perfect French despite getting C's in high school. Uh, but um, but basically in my junior year of high school is where things started to change. I was always a very good chess player. I was competitive. I was, you know, one of the best players in the state or whatever. But my junior year of high school, for example, I got second place in the high school state championship behind my friend, Daniel Naroditsky, who was a fifth grader at the time. He was the- wow. He was like the under 12 world champion, but he was really like, he was one of these guys who had a huge amount of opportunity very early on, worked very hard, made good use of that opportunity. And like, he's also a grandmaster now. Uh, I was but, literally just going to ask, but did he become a grandmaster? It sounds yeah, like, yes. yeah. Was, I mean, he, he, a very good one at that too. I mean, I'm, I'm stronger, but not that much stronger. Uh, and, um, okay. but yeah, so he won that tournament. And so here I am, you know, okay. I got second place in the high school state championship. Fine. But behind a fifth grader, and then over the course of that junior year, I don't know what happened, but something clicked. Um, I qualified for the World Youth to play the Under-16 World Championship for the U.S., and so I flew off to Antalya to play. I missed two weeks of school, which didn't help my grades. And then somewhere between my junior and senior year, something clicked. And then in my senior year of high school, or just before the start of my senior year, this was like maybe six months after getting second place in the high school state championship, I won the actual state championship with adults, the youngest ever at the time at 16. Then I qualified again to play for the U.S. team uh, on the world, world youth this time, but this time the under 18. I was one of the older players in the under 16 the previous year, but because it goes in two year intervals, now I was one of the younger players in the under 18. So it should have been a bigger challenge. And that time I tied for first. So here I am like sharing first place in the under 18 world championship. I was applying to college. I had I got, I was getting C's in high school or like B minuses. I had like a 2.8 or whatever. I was not a great student, but I was 
I had just tied for first in the under 18 world championship. I was far and away the best chess player in the United States applying to college that year. And certainly this helped me get into Brandeis, but I then took a gap year to try to play chess and it just didn't go well. <clears throat> I think the biggest reason for that was my parents did me a huge favor by not supporting me. Uh, I mean, they, it's not like they wanted me to fail, but they they wanted me to go to college first. And uh, they were worried that if I took a year off, I would just never go back to school, but I was burned out. I mean, I was never a great student in high school. It was just so hard the first time around. And I just, I needed a year off and I didn't become, I got a little better at chess, but I had a really horrible end to the year. And uh, I think a big part of that was just because my parents didn't, they were like, well, you're to some extent you're on your own. And here I was 17 years old, living in a house with some other chess players, paying rent and uh, for the first time at, a, at an age quite a bit younger than most people do this stuff for the first time in the, in the US at least. And I think I really grew a lot as a person. I learned to be an adult. I learned these skills that a lot of people start learning in their twenties. Uh, and that's when they sort of stalled and I prevailed as opposed to the other way around for me. But when I came to Brandeis, I had just been on a horrible run and I had basically just said, yeah, I quit chess. I'm gonna go to school. This has been a good ride. I gave it a try for a year, but I'm going to school and I'll do my best. I've got three tournaments to the left that I have to play and then that's it. So the mm -hmm. three tournaments were, um, one was the U.S. Junior Championship, and the second was the U.S. Chess League, where I had been signed up to play board one for New England, going to Brandeis. And then the third was the, Cal the Berkeley International in California. And so um, first one was the U.S. Junior Championship. I came in as the second best junior in the United States at the time. And I, it's a 10-player tournament. I'll play all once. And I lost the first two games to the two lowest rated players. I mean, you could not imagine a worse start than that. It's like, you know, well, yeah, I mean, if there was ever any ambiguity as to whether I should, um, whether I should be going to school or playing chess, that solves the issue. Uh, so, so, I was so, like, so, so, so Sam, when you say you lost to the two low, low, uh, lowest rated players, in terms of, I don't know if you can quantify the rating for us, like how yeah, so are, are, I was are like the lowest rated? I was 2,500, which is just about grandmaster level. I mean, okay. I shouldn't have been a grandmaster, but for some political reasons, I wasn't yet, which was also a huge problem for me. I was, you know, when you're fighting to get that title and then you're held back for sort of kind of nonsensical political reasons. Honestly, of all the injustices that could happen to a human being, that's a pretty darn trivial one to just get it a year later. But it really upset me a lot at the time mm -hmm. and caused a huge amount of emotional damage that I'm not proud of. But and so the players that you lost to were significantly lower than 25. Yeah, they were like 2,200. So 125 points is roughly a doubling of skill. So if I was like 300 points higher than these guys, I should be like significantly bigger than a four to one favorite to beat them. And like probably something like six to one is a good guess, maybe even higher seven to one. And I lost mm -hmm. both games. And wow. so here I am losing both games to the two lowest players in the first two rounds of the U S junior championship, uh, which is all, of course, a very public event too. Like, you know, people are watching me crash and burn. And, you know, I was, I think I was 18 at the time, but you know, that's tough to, to deal with knowing the whole world is just watching you fail, you know? And, uh, Anyhow, the U.S. Women's Championship was actually being held side by side at the same time. And one of the girls in the tournament was saying, uh, she made some comment, come on, cheer up, Sam. You know, you um, it's just the first couple of games. You can still win this tournament. I'm like, dude, I just lost to the two lowest players in rounds yeah. one and two. If I win this tournament, I will wear your dress and pose for pictures. Like, what are you talking about? Okay, eight wins later, I was regretting those words. <laughs> but, <laughs> wow that's so, <laughs> so you ended up beating uh players that were closer to your to your ranking yeah in so in the in the next games in the in the in the seven remaining games i finished with like i think it was yeah six wins and one draw of the remaining seven that tied me for first so there was a three-way playoff and i just cruised straight through the playoff crushed both the other guys and won the u.s junior championship so that wow. was the first that was the first tournament that i had sort of agreed to play in Next up, I had to play board one for the New England Nor'easters in, uh, in the U.S. League. Um, I was the only player who wasn't yet a grandmaster playing board one for any team. I led New England Nor'easters to the only ever undefeated season in the team's his in the league's history. It's, the league is now defunct, so it was the only season ever. But, um, and then, so that was all very good. Then finally, the last one was uh, the Berkeley International. And I had two of the required three norms I needed to become a grandmaster. And I had been traveling the world playing in tournaments in this gap year, looking for the third. And what, I mean, I, I finally made the third norm in the building. I took my first chess class. 
Mm. And so uh, this was Coming just- full circle. That's beautiful. Right. So at this point now, that was that was actually over winter break after my first semester at Brandeis. And I was not planning on playing more chess at that point. I was just going to go to school and be a normal person. But by the U.S. Junior Championship, by winning that, I qualified for the U.S. Championship, which I would then play for the third time. And so I said, OK, U.S. Championship. I mean, that's that's for real. That's very well paid, even if I've even if I crash and burn, I'm going to be one of the like the lowest guy. I, and I came in seated number 15 out of 16. And so I was like, well, I can at least try that. So I figured I should play a warm up tournament. So I played some event, some local event, no big deal. But then I played the US championship thinking, okay, well, let's just see how this goes. Okay, so I came in seated 15th out of 16. I won third place. I won $20,000 as a college freshman. At the time, that was all the money in the world to me. By doing so, I qualified for the World Cup. And I was like, well, now I got to go play the World Cup. So I got to <laughs> prepare for that. I played a couple warm up events in Europe. And in the World Cup, I was seated something like number 120 or something out of 128. And it's mm -hmm. a bracket. So it's, you know, like 128 versus one. And so I'm get paired with Peter Lecco, who at some point had been one game away from being world champion. At the time, he was a little bit older than me. Or sorry, he was a little bit older than he was when he was like really good. But he was still easily like number 15 or 20 in the world. But I thought, holy cow, I have this amazing opportunity to like play with like one of the best players there's ever been. And so I thought, OK, I have to at least play the World Cup. And so I played the World Cup. I had not anticipated sending him home. Uh, so then I beat Peter Lecco and moved on to round two of the World Cup. And I was like, you know, I really tried to quit. I really did. Yeah. So then it just yeah, didn't work. <laughs> this was still the the semester after the the, uh, the winter the winter of your freshman year. January. No, that, the winter of my freshman year was the California tournament. The, I beat Peter Lecco September that year. So what happened? I then lost round Sophomore two year. of the World Cup. Yeah, sophomore. So it would have been the very beginning of sophomore year. I lost round two of the World Cup and showed up at Brandeis like five days late for the start of the semester. I mean, it's just uh, that's that's incredible. I had no idea. We went to obviously we went to school together. I, I had no idea that, you know, when we were walking around, uh, I was yeah. reeling with that semester. I, I was reeling from, you know, my my B plus and intro to law and <laughs> cross paths with you. And you had just um, competed in the World Cup. Uh, there's there's a lot to unpack there, Sam. I mean, I feel like they could make sort of these tournaments into the your own version of the Queen's Gambit. Just you know, hearing about the the competitive struggles that you face, the adversity yeah. um, is is really incredible. And then you alluded to uh, earlier, you had mentioned something about being a grandmaster and uh, how there, there were a lot of politics involved. Could you sort of you know, for the average listener, um, take us through what's the process of becoming a grandmaster so, and, and how difficult was that process for you? So in order to become a grandmaster, you need to have a FIDE rating of 2,500, which is pretty darn high. Uh, but you also, the, that was easy. I got there like long before all this politics happened. But the harder part is you need to have three norms, which means you have to have three tournaments playing nine games at least. Uh, against at least three grandmasters, at least five different countries, and your performance rating has to be over 2,600. So that's like significantly higher than the level of a normal grandmaster. So stuff that would happen, like, for example, there was one tournament where I supposed to make, I was supposed to make a grandmaster run, but they said I missed it. But if any of my opponents was a single point higher rated, I would have made it. And on the previous uh, rating list, one of my opponents had uh, had minus 11.5 points from the previous list, and they rounded that to minus 12. This is wrong. It's live at 0.5, so it should be rounded to minus 11 uh, because the live rating at 0.5 should be rounded to the nearest number. So it should have been, and that wouldn't have affected the pairings at all, so I should have just gotten the norm, and I didn't. There was another one where I even made more, I even scored a, a half point more than I needed for the norm. So like, if I had drawn one of the games I won, I still would have been playing well enough to make the norm, but my opponent in round two had just defected from Cuba and Cuba cut her off. Uh, and she also wasn't that good. I mean, this was one of the early games. So I, I just beat her pretty easily, but uh, she was, she had just defected from Cuba. Cuba cut her off and said, yeah, you defected. We want no part of you, but she had not yet formally switched her allegiance to the United States. So then it was like, oh, well, she doesn't have a federation. So that game against her doesn't count. Sorry. Your tournament was only eight games long, things like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, which obviously had absolutely zero to do with my abilities as a chess player and felt more like it just sort of felt like nonsense again like okay so i had to make two or three more norms than normal to make become a grandmaster as i said of all the injustices that can happen to a human being this is a pretty trivial one but i didn't feel that way at the time and i didn't take it well 
And how old were you again when you became a Grandmaster? When I finally was awarded the title, I was 19, but I should have probably got it at 18. <laughs> okay, and, and is that like like normal, would you say, that you had been playing for about 10 years and you became a Grandmaster at 19? or yeah, do you like, think? I think it was more like eight years that I was playing seriously. Uh, but yeah, that's a pretty normal amount of time. Nowadays, you'd probably make it a little bit faster just because there's better training materials out there, more access to these kinds of things. But at the, in the context of the time when the best players in the world were generally making Grandmaster at like 14 to 16, and I made it at 19, but I started late, I think this was a pretty typical trajectory for a World Elite player. That's that's incredible. And when you just just sort of uh, I, I want to pick your brain for a moment when you meet people on the street and uh, or, you know, you, you come across people in, in uh, your everyday life and you say you're a grandmaster. Do most people know what that means or do you sort of have to explain what the context is? Yeah, the I title? mean, I, do, I, tr I try not to like go flaunt it all the time. Like every now and then I wear my Olympic jacket just because I have nothing else to wear. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I try not to like go around flaunting who I am. Um, most of the time, if that were to happen, it would be because somebody recognizes me, so they already know what's up. But I still remember, for example, there's other countries where chess is bigger. So, for example, one time I was on my, I, I played a tournament in the UAE and was en route to India with my friend, where he's from India. He's, I was going to his home so we could go have a week of training together. And so we're at the transferring airport in Qatar. And at some point, he leaves his bag and goes to the bathroom, and he just leaves the bag with me. So I'm just sitting there. And as soon as he gets up and walks away, some random Indian guy comes up. He's like, oh, my God, was that Surya Shekhar Ganguly? And I was just like, <laughs> yes, it was. It's like, oh, my God, he's a chess grandmaster. And I'm like, yes, he is. He's just sort of, he's, I'm, like, completely unimpressed. And the guy just sort of confused. He just looks at me. Are you a chess grandmaster too? And I'm just like, yes, I am. And he's like, oh my God, so nice to meet you. This is the kind of thing you don't see happen in the US too much, but. Uh, and then that night, cool. you turn on the Indian version of TMZ and it's like Sam Shankland is spotted at the airport yeah. in Qatar. Grandmaster. I wish, I wish um, but not quite. But it was, you, it was, it was you, good stuff. You also mentioned a few minutes ago that when you were competing in one of the tournaments uh, while you were in college, there was a, a prize of, uh, I think you said 3,200 or something like that. Was that a big motivating factor for you? How much did you know the, the, the tournament prizes factor into your ability to, to see, perceive this as a career? Well, it was tough. Like I think in my gap year in between high school and college, I made something like Forty-five or fifty thousand dollars or something. I don't know. I don't have the. That's tax and that's a lot of money for an eighteen-year-old. Even it is, you know. but it also like yeah, I worked really hard for that, and that's also the about amount of money I grossed, not including like, hey, I just traveled the world playing in tournaments, playing for prizes. So, you know, I was able to finance my lifestyle, which was nice uh, to some degree. I mean, I think my parents were probably still paying my car insurance, but like, you know, uh, but I was sort of aware that this is not a really viable long-term plan. Like I, I was living in a house with like four other people and, mm -hmm. you know, so, but yeah, when I won the, when I tied for third in the U S when I got third in the U S championship and won like $20,000 there when I was 18 years old and, or no, I was 19 at the time, but like I was a freshman in college. I just won 20 grand. I mean, that was an unusual amount of money. Let's for someone in that situation. And I sort yeah. of realized I was also teaching a bit in college. Um, I was, I think only charging like, I think I was only charging $60 an hour at the time, but I was charging $60 an hour for lessons. And I was teaching four hours on Tuesday nights, four hours on Thursday nights and two hours on Friday afternoon. So I was like doing a 10 hour work week, which I guess if you were to think about it would almost be like taking one more class essentially. That's probably how much time you have to spend to take another credit. But I was also aware that, you know, hey, I was making like $600 a week in college. That wasn't the worst. Um, mm -hmm. So I was sort of aware that the money was there. And then as I started to get better and the money started to get a lot bigger very fast, it sort of changed my mind a bit. I also got a lot better while I was in college, which was, I think, largely because I had been studying a lot in the previous gap year and just couldn't put it into practice because I was struggling with adulting at 17 or 18. And then I was just sort of all that stuff I had learned was now that I was in a more sheltered environment and not having to make all these big decisions and take care of myself as much, I was more able to put that into practice. Got you, got you. And then, you know, you mentioned that one of the competitors that you uh, faced who had defected from Cuba was a woman. Uh, and, and you think about the Queen's Gambit and portrayal of, of women playing chess. Was that, you know, how did how did gender uh, factor into your, uh, your competition? Did you face mostly men or, or were there also women competing? Yeah, I mean, I, well, 
I only played open chess. So basically, there's no such thing as men's chess. It doesn't exist. There is open chess and there's women's chess. Open chess, absolutely anybody can play. And women's chess is exclusively for women. Obviously, uh, I didn't play any women's tournaments. Um, but uh, when I would play open events, first of all, there's more men than women that play chess. That's a start to it. But I would also play with them a bit more often than was expected just based on the ratios because a lot of the time the women would just be playing in like a women's side section. I certainly did play with some, but less than, even less than you would expect based on, based on the ratio. But uh, I don't know. It's, I, I sort of basically just thought of it as, as a separate world um, that some of these women uh, play in and, you know, sometimes they play with us. I don't really think too much about it, but um, I do like that, uh, that the Queen's Gambit chose to have a female protagonist because one thing that any young girl who starts, goes to a chess club, or let's say she goes to her first tournament and looks at the list of world champions or, or looks at any rating list, she will immediately understand that the men are just better. And that's, they're much better right now. And if we want that to change, more girls have to get involved in the game. Uh, and the way to do that, I think part of it will be giving them positive role models. And because there's no really top women in the world right now, having one in fiction is, I think, very helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but there's, I mean, the whole premise of whether women should be segregated into their own division. I mean, there's no actual segregation because they're welcome to play in the open division, but that's a, that's a very tense debate. If you ask 20 smart people while, while in touch with the chess world, you may get 20 different answers. But um, the one thing I will say was there was only one woman ever who basically said no to women's chess uh, and basically said, I'm going to compete with the men exclusively and just rejected basically every single gender segregated tournament from the time she was 12. And that was Judith Polgar. She made it up to, I believe, number nine in the world. Wow. She was just, um, she was amazing. Was she, she was an American? No, Hungarian. Hungarian, Judith Polgar. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, but then when she retired in 2014, there wasn't, I mean, she had all, she had also dropped off a lot as she had gotten older. She was 37 at the time, but, uh, she retired in 2014, and ever since then, there's just sort of been a void. Uh, believe it or not, I feel some guilt for this. I actually beat her in her last professional game. That is an interesting. That is an interesting fact. Um, yeah. One of the most successful women to ever play chess was <laughs> was well, defeated. By far, not one of the most, by far. Like it, by it, far, no joke. she was the one. Like um, was defeated in her last game by by uh, by Sam yeah. Shanklin. I mean, USA versus Hungary at the Olympiad. I took her down. I, I think you are right, though. I think that you know when you when you see shows like this that uh, have the portrayal of of successful female role models, I think it is inspiring more women. I mean, you, you see right. this out there. Some of the sure. statistics I mentioned earlier to, to start playing chess. I think that's going to change in the future. They also didn't overdo it, though. Like they made her a girl, but like they also, I they mean, there was some it. scene where people were like, oh, what's it like being a girl? But like, it really wasn't a huge factor in the show. They just said exactly. Oh, the same way, like, if I were to make an analogy, if you were to look at, like, the Hunger Games, of you course. Katniss Everdeen as the, as the hero, there was very little mention, oh, she's a hero and she's a woman. It's like, no, she's right. just the hero. And there was basically no mention to her gender at all. I think that's a much exactly. better way of doing it than, like, actually making a big deal. Oh, and she's the first woman to break this barrier, blah, blah. Just, just show she her, break just... the barrier. Like, it's not, that's, I think that's a better way of doing it. The, the implication is, if you make a big deal out of it, like, oh, this is something unusual or she's special because she's female and she can do that. Not like, oh, she's female, she can do this and that's just totally normal. So why do we make a big deal about it? Absolutely. It, it wasn't her, it wasn't exclusively her identity. Um, I want to unpack some of your strategy, Sam, when you're playing these games, much like in baseball, you know, you think about there's power hitters and there's guys that, you know, use their speed and there's guys that rely on this skill set. Would you say that you are a more, you know, intuitive player, you're a planner, are you risk taking, risk risk averse? How would you classify the um, type of player? I'm a very you? objective player. Uh, one thing is I think in general, in terms of my ability to find moves, I'm probably a bit worse than most guys around my level. I think they're generally better at playing chess than me where I think I'm better is uh, where I make up for that. And like, uh, look, ratings don't lie. If, if I have the same rating, they're not a fundamentally better player than I am. But where I think I do well is I work harder than anyone I know. Uh, I train harder. I prepare harder. I am extremely well versed in the beginning of the game as well. Uh, for example, in the opening, I don't know if you're going to show a video, but um, if I could share a screen, for yeah, example. Please. If you look at, if I were to share my screen here, 
I've got this program here. I have opening master base here. This is all of the analysis I've done in my life. I've got, you know, what is this 2267 games of analysis. And if you can look, it looks like the darn Dewey decimal system. It's extremely well organized. So if I ever need to find a line, I can just click it. So like, for example, here, there's what? There's 2200 games. If you say, let's find the Queen's Indian. Let's see how long that will take me. That's going to be right around uh, here. There we go. That took like 10 seconds. And then I've got all of my analysis here. I can choose like, and if you look, I, um, I write stuff like this is the critical line nowadays. I can't find any advantage for white until now. Everything is covered in one of the two sides files. I do this kind of work like really, really well. So I'm, I think I'm generally better prepared than most guys. So I tend to come into the game. If I'm white, when I get the first move, I usually come into the game with a small advantage. If I'm black, I'm almost never worse. It's usually equal. So that's already a good start. I take my physical fitness very seriously. I take my physical health very seriously. Uh, most chess players do, but I think I'm better than most. I also have very good nerves. I have absolutely no problem playing a game with tens of thousands of dollars on the line and no, absolutely no issue focusing or thinking mm. about other stuff in a way that a lot of people who are just better chess players than me who always falter when it matters most. I mean, that matters. And so- And are you able to, Sam, are you able to perform well in front of crowds? You know, you think oh, yeah, about- yeah, it doesn't, doesn't bother me. If you me have thousands slightest. of people watching you, waiting on your every doesn't move- Doesn't bother no me in the slightest. These sort of intangibles that are, don't have anything to do with the direct gameplay itself, I'm very, very good. And I think that makes up for, let's say, the little bit of skill differential between me and other players my level. Uh, you know, if they- are generally a little bit better than me, but hey, guess what? We're playing in the last round and the money's on the line and all the pressure is there. And you're probably more tired than me because I'm in better physical condition and we've been playing for two weeks. You know, these are the kinds of things that tend to give me my competitive edge. Uh, I work really hard. I calculate very well. So that's intuition is something that the more brilliant players like Beth Harmon are portrayed are supposed to have. Um, they just sort of know where the pieces go. I don't want to say I'm not talented because it'd be disingenuous. I obviously am. I think I'm something like a one in maybe 100,000 level talent, which is amazing. But by the rarefied standards of the best players in the world, that sort of makes me a nobody. And to the point that I'm almost uncompetitive with guys who are just true geniuses. Uh, so, but I can, but talent helps you with your instincts. But uh, actually finding the best move is a sub, is a, is going to be a combination of having the right intuition for what you should be playing, but also supplementing that with calculation, seeing if this, then that, if this, then that, constantly calculating stuff. And if you look at me, I mean, I've got endless exercises here my coach is sending me. Every day I'm just putting this position on the board, writing down my wow. solution, solving it. Just really trying to make sure I'm as sharp as possible in calculation. And it is not fun to do that. It is not glorious. It is tedious. It is exhausting. It is depressing when you get it wrong. It is frustrating. But if you do this over and over, you will improve. And it's a choice that I've made to do this a lot. And I think it really shows in my games. And I think a lot of people just don't do it enough. You know, it, it, it's funny uh, hearing you talk about how you've played 10,000 games, how, how you're, you're devoting, what, 12 hours a day to maybe more? To, to, Not that to... much. I, I mean, I, I probably train seriously like four hours a day, but they're a very intense four hours. Four hours a day, but, you know, playing this game for the last – decade um I, I you know i'm curious do you do you get bored of chess um do you yeah. ever reach a point where you're sort of sick of it yeah there's definitely times that you need a break so for example i try to do four solid hours a day of of chess work in one way or another and i would much rather do like it's a very taxing the kind of training i do it's very very hard and i would much rather do four like really good quality hours than like 10 haphazard ones i just think i'll be more effective in the four um but uh, yeah, I mean, it's when you work this hard at something, when you dedicate yourself this much, I mean, no matter what you do, no matter how much you love it, you always need some break. I mean, and so I, I'm a bit of a gym addict. I love to go outside as well. I, there's all sorts of things I try to do as well. Um, I'm actually, surprisingly, I'm a pretty good cook. So I cook myself good food. And, uh, you know, I do other things to keep myself busy and keep myself somewhat distracted. But um, yeah, especially right after a tournament where I've been playing nonstop for days where it's been more than four hours of work every day because games are going to last that long. And then I've got to be preparing and getting ready for the game every day. Usually I'll take like a week off and just relax. So, 
you know, and it calls to mind just just uh, th thinking of you talk about how you have these these other areas of your life and you're not, you know, you don't have tunnel vision with chess. I think there's a quote either from Fisher or uh, Kasparov, and I'm going to butcher it, but it's like to play chess well is the side of uh, a gentleman to play chess perfectly is the sign of a wasted life. I don't know if, if you've if you've heard of that quote. I, I don't know who said this, but I have heard this before. Um, first of all, I think perfection is a, you should always be striving to be a perfect player, but also always understand that you never will be. Uh, I mean, we're human beings. We're fundamentally flawed creatures. We make mistakes. Uh, and you're never going to be perfect, but you should always aim for it anyway, just to be the best version of yourself you can be. But what I found, for example, is if you look at, there's a lot of guys out there who are just, especially guys who grew up in other countries, who grew up, who have just been fed chess from, you know, age three onward and really never knew anything else. The, I think they tend to be better than guys like me who had a more balanced upbringing, but not as much better as you would expect. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and for example, the current world champion, Magnus Carlsen, he definitely chess was clearly his top priority from a young age compared to school but this is a well-rounded guy he's he loves sports he's at some point he was like number live number one in the world in fantasy football or something fantasy soccer i mean he's uh, he's got other hobbies other things he enjoys he likes hanging out with his friends you know he's um and i think you know clearly having chess be your top priority is sort of a prerequisite to be one of the best players in the world but I also think you just, if you're not happy, you're not going to play well. And I don't know, maybe some people can be happy with nothing in their life but chess, but not me. And I think most people are not like that. And I think, Sam, some of that has to do with, with the cultural differences that we mentioned earlier. In, in America, chess is very much a game. In other countries, it's a sporting event. You know, people gather around in Russia or Germany or Hungary yeah. to watch it. So what, what do you think accounts for, for this difference? Well, it's first of all, it's changing in America, thanks in no small part to the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of St. Louis, which came around in 2009 and has been hosting the U.S. Championship ever since. And they've done amazing things. They've hosted fantastic tournaments. They've held training seminars. My biggest regret in my chess career is that they came around when I was 17. I think that if they had been around when I was younger, I might have had like real chances to get even stronger than I am. Of course, uh, that's not their fault. I mean, dude, they, they've, they've done an amazing job. I can only say positive things about everything they've done. But um, ever since they came around and chess became like a much better game, honestly, when my first U.S. championship was the only one I played before it moved to St. Louis. That was 2008. And the winner got like $6,000. And I got 50000 when I won in 2018. I mean, it was just, and not to mention just the increase in prize fund, but just the increase in class, the better coverage, the better, uh, the better commentary team, the the more professional looking room with nice pieces and nice boards. I mean, it's definitely changed a lot, but there's no doubt that it's seen more as a sport in other countries. So for example, in the United States, there's three kinds of players who are in the best among the best in the United States. Uh, number one is players who grew up in other countries and came to the U S as adults already as complete players, you know, moved here when they had basically all of their development happen abroad. Uh, number two would be people who are homeschooled and grew up in the U.S., you know, totally bleed red, white, and blue, but they never went to school and basically just did chess. And then there's me in category number three, somebody who had a sort of normal upbringing. And that doesn't actually speak well for chess in America in general, that I'm sort of me. And I guess, for example, my friend Daniel would be another one who, uh, who I mentioned uh, who won the state championship ahead of me that year. Guys like us are really in the minority compared to people who are foreign grown or who are just homeschooled. And mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest reasons that our homegrown American talents now are just so much better than they were when I was growing up is that more of them are being homeschooled. And there's a huge number of them who are taking chess more seriously. But that just means they're sort of following the models that you'll see in Russia and China and India, stuff like this, where people are given the choice, young kids, I mean, really, of course, it's not their decision, it's their parents' decision, but people are given the choice to, to do this kind of thing from a very early age in a way that just isn't typical in the US, or at least wasn't until recently. So now that people are sort of becoming professionals when they're 12, uh, and you sort of know that they're going through with chess, it's a hard decision for a parent to make because keep in mind for every kid that does this and makes it, there's going to be 10 that don't. And, you know, if you take your kid out of school to become a top chess player and, they, and then they get really good, but not good enough to be like an absolute elite, 
you sort of shot your kid in the foot on that one. And it's a hard decision mm -hmm. for a parent to make, but more parents are making it now. And I think a big part of that is just chess is so much more respected in the US than it was 10 years ago. Definitely. I, I think I think that's a big part of it. I think you're also going to continue to see um, more and more uh, folks are devoting their their career to chess yeah. in the future. But um, oh, go ahead. It's also not... I don't want to sound xenophobic in any way, but it's sort of not an American way of thinking because, for example, um, what I can tell you is every single one of these kids who is homeschooled, or just about everyone that I know who's homeschooled for chess, they are as American as they come. They're born and bred in the United States. They're just 100% American. They bleed red, white, and blue, and there's nothing else to them. But I think all of them have non-American parents. Uh, so it says it's not so much that the players are not American, but they're it's not, it's not so much that American kids don't want to do this, it's that their parents don't want to do it for them. Mm -hmm. Their parents don't want to make that decision. And that's interesting. And one thing I've found is even these American kids with foreign parents whose parents made that decision on their behalf, when these kids grow up and become parents of their, of their own, they don't want to do that themselves either. They want their kids to grow up more traditionally American. And it's, it's very interesting. Uh, I haven't thought too much about it, but... Um, but clearly something happens there. It's hard to explain, I guess, but you get the idea. I, I think it makes sense, I, you know, because you have this, this generational divide and, and the parents are, are sort of, you know, there's almost like a cognitive dissonance. It's, it's unclear whether or not the, the child should go one path or the other. Right. Um, but I do want to, so I want to sort of uh, pick your brain a little bit. Something that I found intriguing about chess is just the infinite number of permutations on a chessboard. I want to run some numbers by you, and and if folks if folks aren't aware of this uh, of these statistics, it's actually kind of startling. So there's ten to the fifteen um, total hairs on all of the human heads in the world. Ten to the fifteen. Right. There's ten to the twenty three grains of sand on Earth, and there's ten to the eighty one atoms in the universe. On a chessboard, Sam. Um, I think there are something like 10 to the 40th possible games of chess that can be played. Um, no. When you, yeah, no, I, so, so essentially th this is, the, you know, this is the, the information that, that I picked up on. You've after got both, wrong information. After both players move, 400 possible board setups exist. After yeah. the second pair of, of turns, there is roughly 200,000 possible games. After three moves, um, 121 million. So when you sort of run, you know, the uh, compare these, uh, the permutations, 10 to the 40th possible um, games of, of chess, and it's rare that you've played the same game twice. Uh, maybe, you know, I maybe the numbers aren't completely precise, but uh, is, is that sort of a testament to um, the, you know, yeah. the uniqueness of every game of chess? Yeah, I mean, you're only off by a factor of about a Google, so it's not <laughs> too imprecise. It's close to 10 to the 160 is the best estimate. But um, 10 to the 160. That's the best estimate, but of course, nobody's actually calculated. It's just an estimate. But yeah, keep in mind, of course, most of those games are nonsensical. Like, if you think about when you're talking about the opening moves, like, there's really only four serious moves I can consider on move one that make any sense at all. There's some others that are sort of fringe attempts, but like of the 20 moves White can make, like there's four that are serious and you're going to see a fair amount. There's maybe another three that like somebody who's feeling goofy and creative might play and everything else is just dumb. And so then Black's responses will be even more limited. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it, that's a bit exaggerated because a lot of those games will be nonsensical, but it says a lot that we've been playing this game for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years that we have incredibly powerful computers firing away on it, including the one I'm talking to you on right now that have just, you know, a huge amount of technical power has gone into it and is still oceans away from solving it. I still remember there was a quote from Larry Kaufman who developed Komodo, uh, one of the, which at the time was the strongest computer engine. Mm -hmm. He did a very good job as the web develop as the as the developer figuring out how to make this machine play the best possible chess it could, and it was the best computer in the world. But at some point, Larry said, um, "The yeah, the I mean, Komodo was just so much better than any human; it wasn't even close." But uh, right. it's um, we long since lost that fight. But at some, at some point, Larry said something like, "At this point, we should just accept Komodo's moves as best, like as a, as fact. Essentially, this is right. this obje the objective truth, and that." comment did not age well. Komodo is like long since forgotten. I mean, nowadays between Stockfish and Leela and Houdini, I think Komodo has just been left behind. And and also that was that version of Komodo. Komodo has gotten stronger since then because it has found, because it's had better 
I guess the code is improved and its evaluation function is improved. And then even that it's not even one of like the top, it's not probably like the fourth best engine or something. I mean, the idea that we would, and it's tough because when we see these machines that will, we just have no chance against, they're just, they seem to know everything that we don't. It's sort of right. tough to under, imagine that like they might not know anything either. Uh, but every year some new one comes out that just beats the old one. And it's like, these things are making mistakes too. I mean, chess will never be solved. It's unbelievably deep. So it's interesting. Um, just you know, just for for listeners who might not be aware of this, uh, the the AI versus human uh, fight in the domain of chess um, really reached its its apex in 1997 when Gary Pas- uh, Kasparov lost the chess mass- uh, six matches to the supercomputer Deep Blue. That was the first time that a, a world chess champion was defeated by a computer under tournament yeah. conditions. And you mentioned Sam. You said we have long since lost this fight. Do you think that there's anything that humans can do in a chess game that an AI can't? Or is it just a matter of the AI can evaluate all the possible moves in any in a you know microsecond and respond and humans have nothing they can do in response? I mean, there might still be some things about chess that humans understand better than computers. But remember when I was talking about calculation, how if I do this, he does that, you calculate one move after another. If I can calculate 100 moves in a minute and a computer is in the billions, I mean, forget it. It's just, that's that different. I think this is the most important skill in chess and the computer is just so much better than humans that there's there's no chance. For what it's worth, in that era, Kasparov lost two games, won one and drew three mm-hmm. against Deep Blue in 1997. And that was a supercomputer. And nowadays, Magnus Carlsen, who's the best player in the world, who has a more, more of an anti-computer style than Kasparov, is I think objectively a better player too. This thing will 6-0 him. I mean, it's, not even close. And and that, I mean, that's becoming an issue now. I, I didn't mention this earlier, but during the pandemic with folks competing from from home like this, they're using chess engines as a way of, you know, if you're uh, playing black, then you open up a, a, a chess engine on chess24chess.com. You you have them, you play white against them and then you just mimic their move. Is that something that, that you've seen or, or heard a lot yeah, about? Yeah, it happens. And basically some people think of it as, some kind of light doping. If I were to make an analogy as to how much of an advantage this would give, it would be imagine running a marathon against a Maserati. Like it's just impossible. Yeah. You will lose every single time. And so this is a very serious issue. Now, there were cheating scandals before the pandemic. There's no doubt about it. You know, people have they managed to sneak into a tournament with something in their ear and they have an accomplice sending wow. them moves or they have something in their shoe and they're like maneuvering it. But it was rare and it was a lot easier to catch. If you're cheating and I'm right and you're right in front of me, you got to be darn sure I'm not going to figure it out. And you know, if you need something that's going to get through a metal detector and still get you the moves in time, that's hard. I mean, I, I'm not going to say you can't do it. I'm sure the CIA could manage, but like, that's not easy. And it takes a lot of effort and you can easily get caught red handed as well. But if I, but like if you're if we're playing a game online and all I have to do is open up that program I just showed you while we're playing on the internet or if I want to do it I can do it on a separate computer if I'm worried about them somehow seeing my desktop and then just copying the moves even if I don't even copy the best moves if I copy the third best moves you're gonna get killed it's just not even close and um, mm-hmm. that's a huge problem so uh, it's happening a lot more in kids events than in adult ones, uh, which I guess is somewhat predictable. But if I were to make an analogy, imagine you're giving kids a test in school. And the way the test works is the kid sits in a room alone, is given the test with nobody watching him, has the book of answers sitting next to him and is told, don't open the book. Yeah. How do you think this will look? I mean, I mean yeah, it's, it's, it's remarkable, especially given what you said about the strength of some of these engines and how the world champion got, you know, beaten six games to none. It's, it's just, um, it, I think it's, it's tantalizing for sure, but uh, it, it's, it's a serious problem. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to solve. I mean, one thing that I think, I think the most important thing that can be done is right now, I believe under the current rule structure, neither USCF, the U S chess federation, nor FIDE, the international one has the authority to ban or punish a player for indiscretions online. I think that needs to change. I think you need to face over the board sanctions for cheating online. This I think will be a good start, but it's 
it's a real problem and it's it's really discouraging and just the knowledge that it could be happening and there's nothing you can do about it is tough for example if you're playing an online match with somebody and you think that and let's say they're not cheating but you aren't don't know that you can start to psych yourself out it can ruin your experience thanks you can become very paranoid start suspecting people who don't deserve to be suspected this can create unwanted drama there's all sorts of really ugly things that can come from this. And even the pro chess league at the end of this year, Armenia beat St. Louis in the final and then the revert result was reversed the next day when it, when it was sort of, I guess they said Armenia cheated. I, I didn't see the games. I, I wasn't following. So I don't know exactly what happened, but that's, this is the pro chess league. These are grandmasters. I mean, grandmasters are getting caught cheating online and that's, I mean, there was one tournament, the one that discouraged me the most was the barber tournament. I had a student in it. And the Barber tournament is the tournament of middle school state champions. There's 50 players. Every player who won their state championship for the middle school section uh, gets to participate. They qualify, and then the winner can get some kind of college scholarship. It's a great idea. Um, it's a tournament of state champions. These are not random kids. These are the champions of their states. And I think something like four out of the 50 players got expelled from the tournament. That's Four got expelled. That, that means they got caught. Who knows right. how many and did it? It, it, it just, it's, it's, it's bewildering because, you know, it's almost like these people are already good enough to qualify for that level of competition. Why do they feel like they need another edge? You know what I mean? I mean Rather than just work hard. It's, it's, I mean, they want to win. They're crazy competitive. They hate losing, you know, you're dealing with young people with a fair amount of money on the line. It's, with, I, with I guess parents, it makes sense. You know, their parents often are pressuring them very hard to succeed and their parents certainly don't tell them go cheat that I don't know any parent who ever tells their kid, go cheat on this test or go cheat in this game. But like, if their parents are like, no, you need to win, you need to win. And is, and is pushing them are pushing them really hard. And this kid loses and the parents are really disappointed in them and it breaks the kid's darn heart. You can easily see how they, the temptation to cheat is there. And right. it's not a good thing. We really, I mean, there has to be very stern punishments against it, but nowadays, basically, if you cheat online, you're going to get banned on, if you get caught, which is an if you're going to get banned on that website. It's going to be anonymous. You're no one's ever going to know what you did. You're not going to face any sanctions in tournaments. It just feels so light. I mean, for me, it's mine. I mean, it's a little bit different with kids, but if an adult gets caught cheating, I would never want to see him play chess again. Right. I mean, but yeah, I think I, it, it need, absolutely needs to change. So, so far, you know, we've been talking very abstractly about uh, how the game of chess is played. Most of the people listening, Sam, I would say 100% of them have not competed um, yeah. at the level that you have. They, they haven't competed at the U.S. Olympics. They haven't competed at the World Cup. So for folks listening who are maybe just getting into chess, maybe they, they play competitively with their friends um, online, how exactly do you recommend that someone gets better at chess? Is it as simple as the 10,000 hours rule that Malcolm Gladwell talks about, just practice, practice, practice? Um, or is yeah, it something I mean, more than that? I think a good start is, I mean, what worked for me was training a lot of tactical puzzles at the time that meant reading tactics books and solving the puzzles. Nowadays, there's online resources on, I think my favorite is Chess Tempo, but there's all sorts of, there like chess.com has something called Puzzle Rush, Chess24 has, I literally just did it, um, I'm blanking on it, but they have something very similar. Chess24, chess.com, and um, and uh, chess tempo all like have very good exercises online but i think the number one thing you can do is just get games in against people better than you study what happened when you lose to them and listen to them when they talk to you i think that's a good start just like anything else if somebody is better than you you try to learn from them i mean at the then, beginning of our conversation you called it a free lesson you said when yeah. you when when people you know beat you and you said how did how did you win and they told you that was the free lesson that's the mindset you need yeah i mean it, it, that's a much better way of handling it than oh you got so lucky even if they did um you know you should i mean first of all just being a decent human being and showing respect to your opponent is part of being a good athlete and just decent sportsmanship but uh you really learn a lot i mean you know, when you have the chance to play people that are better than you, which for me now is very, very rare. I, I really relish it when I get the chance. The one time I ever got to play with Magnus in a classical game was, uh, it was a draw. It wasn't a wildly interesting game either, but I talked to him for as long as he would listen to me. <laughs> you know, I wanted to hear what he had to say about the game, even if it was a pretty dull encounter that never got off the ground. But um and when yeah. you, I, I, again, again, for listeners that aren't super familiar, when you say it's a draw, is that usually just, just a, agreed upon or how does well, that work? I mean, okay. For, there's lots of ways. 
a quick draw where people just agree to a draw without playing, that's the bane of my existence. And when I was excluded from the FIDE Grand Prix last year and watched as by a last minute rules change and watched as all the guys who did get invited just agreed like 12 move draws every other game. Oh man. I, yeah. I don't advocate violence, but let's just say I was tempted. Right. Um, but I was really mad. But no, a typical draw will be like if enough pieces come off the board and you can't win anymore. You fought for 40, 50 moves. Almost all the pieces are off the board. Both sides have no weaknesses and very few pieces left. And there's nothing left to do. That's sort of how my game with Magnus went, for example. Um, but yeah, that's typically how a draw will happen. Uh, there's other ways, but yeah. Got you, got you, got you. Um, you also mentioned, you know, how if you could memorize all of the information on your spreadsheets that would give you a huge edge, such as like playing against an engineer computer. So do you think that there's an element of rote memorization to it that people need to memorize openings or memorize possible moves? Yeah, there, there certainly is. And there's no way that you can memorize all that analysis. Uh, plus you have to constantly be making more because I can guarantee you almost everything there is going to be obsolete in three years when computers are getting better and better analysis and better tools are out there. So you have to constantly be updating it. Once you've been lurking on one line for a while and you've not paid attention to something else that's relevant, there's two, there's over 2000 files, all of which are long. There's no way you memorize it all. So one thing that I think I do really well is I have very good mnemonics in these files so that, and they're very well organized. So if for example, there's a line that I see my opponent is playing and I have to analyze, uh, I will very quickly find my analysis because I'm well organized. Once I'm there, it's very, I will very quickly see what my original conclusions were, uh, understand them pretty well. And then I have the mnemonics in place. If I were to try to point one out, let me see if I can, I'll share screen again. Let me see if I can show you what I mean. You're but showing like, us your, your trade secrets a little bit. We appreciate yeah, but it. So for example, if I go to opening master base uh, and, I, and I pick out, uh, let's say this Grunfeld, I want to play rook b1, knight c6, and I'm seeing this guy is playing bishop takes c3 check. Here I write here, as you see, bishop takes c3 check, very risky. Mm. Um, I'll write things like no knight b8, dubious. I hadn't even remembered this move at all. Nobody ever does this, but white does have to be precise to prove an edge. Maybe this isn't the best one to write about, but um, okay, this probably. But for example, I write something like here, rook e8. I wrote actually d takes e4. This may be the safest. This probably wasn't a good file to choose. Maybe I should do something I've looked at a bit more recently. But, it's incredible um, that, that not only have you um, annotated all these moves and thought them through, but each one has, has like a carefully considered comment. Yeah. So, but for example, like um, if you write here, uh, what I write is um, I so here, for example, after castles, I write this line here. I don't know how much, you know, about chess, but for example, I wrote here that uh, in the event of E takes F4, queen takes f4. This apparently isn't that good for black because uh, I'm not in time to get bishop e5 and take this pawn because queen takes f7 is there. But if I write here rook e6, rook d1, e takes f4 exclamation part, I wrote now that f7 is not hanging, this is not an issue. The implication of that is by bringing my rook here, attacking the pawn, I have compelled white's rook to come to this square. And as a result, now when white takes this, because this rook is no longer here, White is not threatening this pawn anymore. This is the kind of mnemonic that I will write to myself. And then if I see this position, like if I remember, if I look at this position now, obviously I know what to do. Great. But if I know that now, and then I have to see the same position nine months later, and this is just one of the zillion things that I studied by having that memory, that mnemonic note, oh, we play E takes F4 only once White's Rook has been provoked to D1. This will help me remember things when it comes time to play in the game. Your, your, your mind works so incredibly fast. I think every, every move that you just went through in that formulation, I, I probably would have understood if I had an hour to go okay. through it. And that's, uh, that's something, and, and that's something that I think um, at least beginners like myself struggle with is, is timing. Uh, I don't know if you have any advice on that. Cause uh, you know, when, when you're playing in a, in a real tournament environment, you can't sit for 20 minutes to think over your first few moves. You have to just be ready to go, go, go. I think timing is a lot about confidence uh, and you absolutely have to have the right amount. Players who lack confidence, they take too much time on their moves. They overthink it. They get into massive time trouble later on when they have very little time remaining to make a, a bunch of moves and they start making mistakes. Players who are arrogant believe they've seen everything. They play too fast. They don't double check their analysis enough. And then they constantly end up, you know, even if they win, they'll end up with much more time than they should, meaning they left a lot of time that they could have spent thinking about the game and making better moves. And they often are prone to making silly mistakes because they 
are moving too fast. You need to have a healthy balance. And I think really it's about confidence. You need the right amount of confidence to understand the good way of thinking about it is chess is a difficult game. I know I have to work hard to find the best move. I know that it won't come easily, but I should also have confidence in my convictions that when I have come to the decision that I believe is best, I believe in myself and I will make that decision and not overthink it any further. I think that's incredible advice. And, and you mentioned earlier, play against people better than you so you can learn from them. Do you think it's better to play against a human opponent online or to play against an engine or a computer who's I at don't, a certain... I think there's very little to learn from playing with the machine. It will teach you all of the wrong habits. Uh, it will teach you to never speculate or never do anything risky. Um, if you can sacrifice, for example, if you can sacrifice a piece but get a very dangerous attack against the king, it's very unlikely you're going to ever checkmate a computer. Uh, a computer will defend it and save it, take your piece and laugh at you. If you play enough games like this, if you play enough games like this, you will intuitively learn to never sacrifice stuff. That's wrong. You need to, there's times when humans will fail. So, I mean, that, I, I think that you've sort of, uh, you know, uh, you've sort of answered my question from earlier about what can humans do better than computers? Because you mentioned that we've lost the, the competition against AI. AI is better in every respect, but it sounds like in certain scenarios, AI will just protect the piece um, and not really see well, the larger picture. Yeah, I mean, computers lack practicality. So for example, if I have to choose between two moves, especially like imagine I'm preparing with for you, we're about to play a game. I've seen a bunch of your games and I've seen one position that I think we will reach if I, or I suspect that we will reach based on how you have played. And I'm analyzing this position with the machine and the machine is giving me two options. And the first one, it says I have a small advantage. And after just about every move you can make, let's say your top five moves, I remain with a small advantage. And then I look at the machine's second move and it says this position is equal. But then I dig a little bit deeper and I find that it is equal because you have to find a very precise string of like six perfect moves in a row. And if you miss a single one of them, you're just dead. In practice, I think it's much better for me to just put you to the test and say, I'm gonna play this other one. If you find six perfect moves, fine, it will be equal. And if you don't, you're about to die. That is a very good practical decision to make that a computer just will not make. Uh, it will say objectively, the best move is to play this way. This gives me a small advantage, assuming perfect play from my opponent. But you also have to think, even if like I get this small advantage, am I actually going to win this game? Or like how good are my chances to win that game? And I think in this scenario, I mean, what I've described is pretty extreme, but your better chances are just saying, hey, these are six difficult moves in a row. You have to find all of them. Just, you know, it, a good way of thinking about it as well. Imagine I got, I played this the safe way or the way the computer recommends and I get my small advantage. And now imagine my opponent just continue, proceeds to play perfectly. I'm not going to win the game anyway. You know, you have small advantage, opponent plays great. You're not going to win. Uh, it's going to be a draw. And so it's like, well, you might as well take your chance at getting a big advantage by putting your opponent to the practical test. And that's just not something computers are capable of figuring out yet. And when you reach that point in the game, when you know there's no way you can win, is that when uh, the participant will resign or, or, or are those resignations pretty rare in, in practice? You, yeah, you resign if you're clearly dead. Um, but, or, uh, and you will agree a draw if the game is clearly a draw, but you don't wanna, I, 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 my rule of thumb is you resign when you think your odds of saving of anything other than losing are somewhere around one in a thousand, I think is okay. the best. When it's one in a thousand, odds of losing, then you resign. When, when there's 999 in a thousand that you're going to yeah. lose, and one yeah, in a yeah. thousand that you will draw, but, for example. Gotcha. I mean, like some it's, people just say never resign, but this fails for two reasons. One is you're just assuming that you have infinite energy. Like if you have a dead lost position and there's just almost like next to 0% chance you're going to save it, it's probably better to just resign and play the next game and have more energy for it than to like I, keep bashing your head against the wall for another hour. Um, it'll give you more time to clear your head, more time to prepare for your next opponent. But also, like if I think about all the free lessons I got from uh, from get learning from people who were better than me, if you just piss somebody off by playing forever and exactly. almost insulting their intelligence when you're just dead, I mean, you don't want to resign too early. I mean, I did that once in my career in a very embarrassing manner when I resigned a position that was not losing. But I was also U.S. champion at the time, so it was you know pretty. Uh, that was a pretty big deal, but. I've done that once in my entire career. And it's just like, you, you knowing when to resign is you sort of, it's just sort of something that comes to you in time. And, and, but you, 
when in doubt, don't. I mean, like if there's if you're not sure, you probably should keep playing. But when it's clear that you're dead, you should give it up. And you just knock down the king and, and extend your hand. And, and Usually that's... you'll just you'll just extend your hand or, or stop the clock. Normally, I think knocking down the king is actually bad sportsmanship nowadays because it almost looks like you're flustered or like. But uh, like, more yeah. importantly, like... more importantly, oftentimes uh, people want to see what the final position is. And if you like knock your king off and some pieces like roll over the board and then the final position gets messed up, they don't like get to th- see what th- the final position was. You're like throwing the board off uh, over. So that that's that's actually that that's amazing. Um, and Sam, the last question I'll ask you. Uh, let's say that someone's listening right now and they've they've heard us talk about chess for 75 minutes, um, but for some reason they they're not really interested in chess. They've never played. I don't know why they would have listened this far. But yeah. what what you know? How would you pitch how would you sell chess why should people care about chess to to someone who hasn't played has no desire to play what's what's the benefit of chess well it's how an incredibly you- deep game that will train you to think it will train you to make proper decisions uh think well under pressure for example um there's all sorts of practical life skills that come from it one thing i've found uh which some people might say is a bad trait but i think is a good one chess players are incredibly hard people to offend which I think is a pretty cool thing. Uh, they're just so used to, you know, every move they make is sort of an idea or opinion of theirs. And every single move they make, it comes under scrutiny from their opponent. They're just used to their opinions being challenged. They're used to people putting them under pressure. It's very hard to offend a chess player. And I think that's a relatively admirable quality. Um, yeah, It teaches you to process information quickly. It teaches you to cope with defeat uh, without being too salty about it it teaches you to win like a champion as well without disrespecting your opponent uh you can challenge yourself to make better decisions it really helps your ability with memory uh it helps you think logically it helps you think systematically it learns it um i was about to say one other thing but uh and yeah you can make yeah you can make friends doing it i mean it's a social game and it's elements and uh it's just uh, i also think there's even a study chess players don't get alzheimer's Wow. I mean, yeah, that, that sounds like there might be a third uh, party correlating factor with folks who have like more healthy, um, you know, uh, cognitive faculties or train your mind, just like you trained your body. I I think it makes, makes perfect sense. And if if you haven't played chess, I know one of my friends recently, um, I asked her, Hey, you want to play a game? And she said something like, Oh, I'm, I'm too old to play chess. I, you know, I, I, I never, I never learned. Like, I'm not going to start now when I'm 25 years old, but give oh, it a try. 25? What? I thought you were talking about like a grandma. Come on. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really never, never too late. Um, and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun on top of, of everything else that, that Sam's saying. Um, so listen, this has been an incredible conversation. I have selfishly learned a lot from listening to you and I'm sure everyone out there uh, has learned a ton from you as well. Uh, Listeners want to know, Sam, you mentioned that you give lessons. Uh, I know you have a book coming out. So where can they go to connect with you and to learn more about your work? Yeah, so I have a website, samshankwan.com, that gives some of my career highlights and stuff, a little bit about me. And uh, I teach private lessons. I teach classes. I play tournaments when tournaments return. I certainly am looking forward to getting back. But if anybody wants to like book a talk with me or a simultaneous exhibition where I like play a whole bunch of people at once, or, or book a lesson or, or buy my books or anything like that, they can just go to my website. It should be pretty user-friendly. And uh, all that stuff is up, information for sale, contact form, you name it. So samshanklin.com. And are, are you on the socials, Twitter, Instagram? Yeah, I, uh, I have Twitter. Inst- I made Instagram just like a month or two ago, actually. But I'm not huge on social media. But yeah, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, GM Shanky, at Facebook, GM Sam Shanklin, and Instagram, GM Sam Shanklin. I've got pages. I'm not... I'm not a big social media guy, but I, I update them now. Sam Shanklin, super grandmaster, grandmaster, Olympic champion, one of the best in the country, one of the best in the world. Thank you so much for, for joining me today. Really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. It's been fun.